Pankaj Sohal, and this study was done in my laboratory at the University of California at San Francisco. Here we set out to answer two questions about how inhibitory interneurons might contribute to seizures. First, we wanted to know whether there are some conditions under which inhibitory interneurons might act to promote seizures. And second, we wanted to know whether or not different types of interneurons contribute similarly or in distinct ways to seizures. Historically, these questions have been difficult to answer because of two challenges. It has been difficult to control and observe different subtypes of interneurons, and in particular, to do so just as seizures are about to begin. Here we were able to develop a method to optogenetically induce seizures at specific moments in time, and then take advantage of this method to image or manipulate interneurons just at the moment of seizure onset. Hi, my name is Satar Koshku, and I'm the first author on this study. I will walk you through some of the techniques that we used. Also, I will be sharing some of our more intriguing findings with you. In order to achieve optogenetic seizure induction, we use a viral vector to focally express a depolarizing light-activated ion channel, channel rhodopsin, and mouse cortical and cytotory neurons. Subsequently, we use an optical fiber to deliver pulse blue light to these neurons and kindle these animals to have seizures within minutes. Interestingly, these seizures are separated in time from the optical stimulus and allow for cellular manipulation and imaging in the pre-ectal period. Additionally, they closely mimic spontaneous seizures in terms of both their electrographic and behavioral characteristics. To perform cell type specific recordings during seizures, we use a fluorescent calcium indicator, GCAMP6F. We selectively express GCAMP in specific groups of neurons using Cree technology. Then we perform simultaneous bulk calcium imaging and EEG recording during optogenetically induced seizures in vivo. Surprisingly, we discovered that at the time of seizure onset, inhibitory interneurons seem to have a surge in their activity that precedes the activation of excitatory neurons by several cycles, potentially suggesting that interneurons may play a key role in seizure initiation. Additionally, parvalbumin and somatostatin expressing interneuron activity seems to persist at a high level until seizure termination which was not the case for VIP-expressing interneurons and excitatory neurons. In order to better understand the role of different types of interneurons in seizures, we used a hyperpolarizing light-activated ion channel, ARCH, to selectively silence the activity of parvalbumin, somatostatin, and VIP interneurons. We were able to demonstrate that inhibiting VIP interneurons increased the optogenetic seizure threshold and decreased seizure length suggesting a consistent anti-seizure effect. This finding is consistent with the disinhibitory role of VIP interneurons. On the contrary, silencing parvalbumin and somatostatin interneurons decreased the optogenetic seizure threshold. However, it also decreased seizure length. Interestingly, when we inhibited parvalbumin and somatostatin populations individually, we saw different effects. This is suggestive of a complex and dynamic role for parvalbumin and somatostatic interneurons during seizures. So here are a few of the things we've learned. First, inhibitory interneurons are rapidly recruited right at the time of seizure onset, well before their excitatory counterparts. Second, parvalbumin and somatostatin expressing interneurons maintain their activity throughout a seizure. Third, inhibiting VIP expressing interneurons has anticonvulsive effects, both in terms of seizure threshold and seizure duration. And fourth, parvalbumin and somatostatin-expressing interneurons appear to help maintain ongoing seizures.